Chapter Ten, Part Two of the Narrative of the Life of Frederick Douglass, an American Slave, written by himself, by Frederick Douglass. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Jesse Zuba. Chapter Ten, Part Two. On the first of January, eighteen thirty four, I left Mr. Covey and went to live with Mr. William Freeland, who lived about three miles from St. Michael's. I soon found Mr. Freeland a very different man from Mr. Covey. Though not rich, he was what would be called an educated southern gentleman. Mr. Covey, as I have shown, was a well-trained negro-breaker and slave-driver. The former, slaveholder though he was, seemed to possess some regard for honor, some reverence for justice, and some respect for humanity. The latter seemed totally insensible to all such sentiments. Mr. Freeland had many of the faults peculiar to slaveholders, such as being very passionate and fretful, but I must do him the justice to say that he was exceedingly free from those degrading vices to which Mr. Covey was constantly addicted. The one was open and frank, and we always knew where to find him. The other was a most artful deceiver, and could be understood only by such as were skillful enough to detect his cunningly devised frauds another advantage i gained in my new master was he made no pretensions to or profession of religion and this in my opinion was truly a great advantage i assert most unhesitatingly that the religion of the south is a mere covering for the most horrid crimes a justifier of the most appalling barbarity a sanctifier of the most hateful frauds and a dark shelter under which the darkest, foulest, grossest, and most infernal deeds of slaveholders find the strongest protection. Were I to be again reduced to the chains of slavery, next to that enslavement, I should regard being the slave of a religious master the greatest calamity that could befall me, for of all slaveholders with whom I have ever met, religious slaveholders are the worst. I have ever found them the meanest and basest, the most cruel and cowardly of all others. It was my unhappy lot not only to belong to a religious slaveholder, but to live in a community of such religionists. Very near Mr. Freeland lived the Reverend Daniel Whedon, and in the same neighborhood lived the Reverend Rigby Hopkins. These were members and ministers in the Reformed Methodist Church. Mr. Whedon owned, among others, a woman slave whose name I have forgotten. This woman's back, for weeks, was kept literally raw, made so by the lash of this merciless religious wretch. He used to hire hands. His maxim was, behave well or behave ill. It is the duty of a master occasionally to whip a slave, to remind him of his master's authority. Such was his theory, and such was his practice. Mr. Hopkins was even worse than Mr. Whedon. His chief boast was his ability to manage slaves. The peculiar feature of his government was that of whipping slaves in advance of deserving it. He always managed to have one or more of his slaves to whip every Monday morning. He did this to alarm their fears and strike terror into those who escaped. His plan was to whip for the smallest offenses, to prevent the commission of large ones. Mr. Hopkins could always find some excuse for whipping a slave. It would astonish one, unaccustomed to a slaveholding life, to see with what wonderful ease a slaveholder can find things of which to make occasion to whip a slave. A mere look, word, or motion, a mistake, accident, or want of power, are all matters for which a slave may be whipped at any time. Does a slave look dissatisfied? It is said he has the devil in him, and it must be whipped out. Does he speak loudly when spoken to by his master? then he is getting high-minded, and should be taken down a buttonhole lower. Does he forget to pull off his hat at the approach of a white person? Then he is wanting in reverence, and should be whipped for it. Does he ever venture to vindicate his conduct when censured for it? Then he is guilty of impotence, one of the greatest crimes of which a slave can be guilty. Does he ever venture to suggest a different mode of doing things, from that pointed out by his master? He is indeed presumptuous, and getting above himself, and nothing less than a flogging will do for him. Does he, while ploughing, break a plough, or, while hoeing, break a hoe? It is owing to his carelessness, and for it a slave must always be whipped. Mr. Hopkins could always find something of this sort to justify the use of the lash, 
and he seldom failed to embrace such opportunities there was not a man in the whole country with whom the slaves who had the getting their own home would not prefer to live rather than with this reverend mr hopkins and yet there was not a man anywhere round who made higher professions of religion or was more active in revivals more attentive to the class love feast prayer and preaching meetings or more devotional in his family that prayed earlier later louder and longer than this same reverend slave-driver rigby hopkins but to return to mr freeland and to my experience while in his employment he like mr covey gave us enough to eat but unlike mr covey he also gave us sufficient time to take our meals he worked us hard but always between sunrise and sunset he required a good deal of work to be done but gave us good tools with which to work his farm was large but he employed hands enough to work it and with ease compared with many of his neighbors my treatment while in his employment was heavenly compared with what i experienced at the hands of mr edward covey mr freeland was himself the owner of but two slaves their names were henry harris and john harris the rest of his hands he hired these consisted of myself sandy jenkins and handy caldwell note this is the same man who gave me the roots to prevent my being whipped by mr covey he was a clever soul we used frequently to talk about the fight with covey and as often as we did so he would claim my success as the result of the roots which he gave me this superstition is very common among the more ignorant slaves a slave seldom dies but that his death is attributed to trickery henry and john were quite intelligent and in a very little while after i went there i succeeded in creating in them a strong desire to learn how to read this desire soon sprang up in the others also they very soon mustered up some old spelling books and nothing would do but that i must keep a sabbath school i agreed to do so and accordingly devoted my sundays to teaching these my loved fellow-slaves how to read neither of them knew his letters when i went there some of the slaves of the neighboring farms found what was going on and also availed themselves of this little opportunity to learn to read it was understood among all who came that there must be as little display about it as possible it was necessary to keep our religious masters at st michael's unacquainted with the fact that instead of spending the sabbath in wrestling boxing and drinking whiskey we were trying to learn how to read the will of god for they had much rather see us engaged in those degrading sports than to see us behaving like intellectual moral and accountable beings my blood boils as i think of the bloody manner in which messrs wright fairbanks and garrison west both class leaders in connection with many others rushed in upon us with sticks and stones and broke up our virtuous little sabbath school at st michael's all calling themselves christians humble followers of the lord jesus christ but i am again digressing i held my sabbath school at the house of a free colored man whose name i deem it imprudent to mention for should it be known it might embarrass him greatly though the crime of holding the school was committed ten years ago i had at one time over forty scholars and those of the right sort ardently desiring to learn they were of all ages though mostly men and women i look back to those sundays with an amount of pleasure not to be expressed they were great days to my soul the work of instructing my dear fellow-slaves was the sweetest engagement with which i was ever blessed we loved each other and to leave them at the close of the sabbath was a severe cross indeed when i think that these precious souls are to-day shut up in the prison-house of slavery my feelings overcome me and i am almost ready to ask does a righteous god govern the universe and for what does he hold the thunders in his right hand if not to smite the oppressor and deliver the spoiled out of the hand of the spoiler these dear souls came not to sabbath school because it was popular to do so nor did i teach them because it was reputable to be thus engaged every moment they spent in that school they were liable to be taken up and given thirty-nine lashes they came because they wished to learn their minds had been starved by their cruel masters they had been shut up in mental darkness i taught them because it was the delight of my soul to be doing something that looked like bettering the condition of my race i kept up my school nearly the whole year i lived with mr freeland 
and beside my sabbath school i devoted three evenings in the week during the winter to teaching the slaves at home and i have the happiness to know that several of those who came to sabbath school learned how to read and that one at least is now free through my agency the year passed off smoothly it seemed only about half as long as the year which preceded it i went through it without receiving a single blow i will give mr freeland the credit of being the best master i ever had till i became my own master for the ease with which i passed the year i was however somewhat indebted to the society of my fellow-slaves they were noble souls they not only possessed loving hearts but brave ones we were linked and interlinked with each other i loved them with a love stronger than anything i have experienced since it is sometimes said that we slaves do not love and confide in each other in answer to this assertion i can say i never loved any or confided in any people more than my fellow-slaves and especially those with whom i lived at mr freeland's i believe we would have died for each other we never undertook to do anything of any importance without a mutual consultation we never moved separately we were one and as much so by our tempers and dispositions as by the mutual hardships to which we were necessarily subjected by our condition as slaves at the close of the year 1834, Mr. Freeland again hired me of my master for the year 1835, but by this time I began to want to live upon free land as well as with Freeland, and I was no longer content, therefore, to live with him or any other slaveholder. I began with the commencement of the year to prepare myself for a final struggle which should decide my fate one way or the other. My tendency was upward. I was fast approaching manhood, and year after year had passed, and I was still a slave. These thoughts roused me. I must do something. I therefore resolved that 1835 should not pass without witnessing an attempt, on my part, to secure my liberty. But I was not willing to cherish this determination alone. My fellow slaves were dear to me. I was anxious to have them participate with me in this, my life-giving determination. I therefore, though with great prudence, commenced early to ascertain their views and feelings in regard to their condition and to imbue their minds with thoughts of freedom i bent myself to devising ways and means for our escape and meanwhile strove on all fitting occasions to impress them with the gross fraud and inhumanity of slavery i went first to henry next to john then to the others i found in them all warm hearts and noble spirits they were ready to hear and ready to act when a feasible plan should be proposed this was what i wanted i talked to them of our want of manhood if we submitted to our enslavement without at least one noble effort to be free we met often and consulted frequently and told our hopes and fears recounted the difficulties real and imagined which we should be called on to meet at times we were almost disposed to give up and try to content ourselves with our wretched lot at others we were firm and unbending in our determination to go whenever we suggested any plan there was shrinking the odds were fearful our path was beset with the greatest obstacles and if we succeeded in gaining the end of it our right to be free was yet questionable we were yet liable to be returned to bondage we could see no spot this side of the ocean where we could be free we knew nothing about canada our knowledge of the north did not extend farther than new york and to go there and be forever harassed with the frightful liability of being returned to slavery with the certainty of being treated tenfold worse than before the thought was truly a horrible one and one which it was not easy to overcome the case sometimes stood thus at every gate through which we were to pass we saw a watchman at every ferry a guard on every bridge a sentinel and in every wood a patrol we were hemmed in upon every side here were the difficulties real or imagined the good to be sought and the evil to be shunned on the one hand there stood slavery a stern reality glaring frightfully upon us its robes already crimsoned with the blood of millions and even now feasting itself greedily upon our own flesh on the other hand away back in the dim distance under the flickering light of the north star behind some craggy hill or snow-covered mountain stood a doubtful freedom 
half frozen beckoning us to come and share its hospitality this in itself was sometimes enough to stagger us but when we permitted ourselves to survey the road we were frequently appalled upon either side we saw grim death assuming the most horrid shapes now it was starvation causing us to eat our own flesh now we were contending with the waves and were drowned now we were overtaken and torn to pieces by the fangs of the terrible bloodhound we were stung by scorpions chased by wild beasts bitten by snakes and finally after having nearly reached the desired spot after swimming rivers encountering wild beasts sleeping in the woods suffering hunger and nakedness we were overtaken by our pursuers and in our resistance we were shot dead upon the spot i say this picture sometimes appalled us and made us rather bear those ills we had than fly to others that we knew not of in coming to a fixed determination to run away we did more than patrick henry when he resolved upon liberty or death with us it was a doubtful liberty at most and almost certain death if we failed for my part i should prefer death to hopeless bondage sandy one of our number gave up the notion but still encouraged us our company then consisted of henry harris john harris henry bailey charles roberts and myself henry bailey was my uncle and belonged to my master charles married my aunt he belonged to my master's father-in-law mr william hamilton the plan we finally concluded upon was to get a large canoe belonging to mr hamilton and upon the saturday night previous to easter holidays paddle directly up the chesapeake bay on our arrival at the head of the bay a distance of seventy or eighty miles from where we lived it was our purpose to turn our canoe adrift and follow the guidance of the north star till we got beyond the limits of maryland our reason for taking the water route was that we were less liable to be suspected as runaways we hoped to be regarded as fishermen whereas if we should take the land route we should be subjected to interruptions of almost every kind any one having a white face and being so disposed could stop us and subject us to examination the week before our intended start i wrote several protections one for each of us as well as i can remember they were in the following words to wit this is to certify that i the undersigned have given the bearer my servant full liberty to go to baltimore and spend the easter holidays written with mine own hand etc eighteen thirty five william hamilton near st michael's in talbot county maryland we were not going to baltimore but in going up the bay we went toward baltimore and these protections were only intended to protect us while on the bay as the time drew near for our departure our anxiety became more and more intense it was truly a matter of life and death with us the strength of our determination was about to be fully tested at this time i was very active in explaining every difficulty removing every doubt dispelling every fear and inspiring all with the firmness indispensable to success in our undertaking assuring them that half was gained the instant we made the move we had talked long enough we were now ready to move if not now we never should be and if we did not intend to move now we had as well fold our arms sit down and acknowledge ourselves fit only to be slaves this none of us were prepared to acknowledge every man stood firm and at our last meeting we pledged ourselves afresh in the most solemn manner that at the time appointed we would certainly start in pursuit of freedom this was in the middle of the week at the end of which we were to be off we went as usual to our several fields of labor but with bosoms highly agitated with thoughts of our truly hazardous undertaking we tried to conceal our feelings as much as possible and i think we succeeded very well after a painful waiting the saturday morning whose night was to witness our departure came i hailed it with joy bring what of sadness it might friday night was a sleepless one for me i probably felt more anxious than the rest because i was by common consent at the head of the whole affair the responsibility of success or failure lay heavily upon me the glory of the one and the confusion of the other were alike mine the first two hours of that morning were such as i never experienced before and hoped never to again early in the morning we went as usual to the field 
we were spreading manure and all at once while thus engaged i was overwhelmed with an indescribable feeling in the fullness of which i turned to sandy who was near by and said we are betrayed well said he that thought has this moment struck me we said no more i was never more certain of anything the horn was blown as usual and we went up from the field to the house for breakfast i went for the form more than for want of anything to eat that morning just as i got to the house and looking out at the lane gate i saw four white men with two colored men the white men were on horseback and the colored ones were walking behind as if tied I watched them a few moments till they got up to our lane gate. Here they halted and tied the colored men to the gate post. I was not yet certain as to what the matter was. In a few moments in rode Mr. Hamilton with speed betokening great excitement. He came to the door and inquired if Master William was in. He was told he was at the barn. Mr. Hamilton, without dismounting, rode up to the barn with extraordinary speed. In a few moments he and Mr. Freeland returned to the house. By this time the three constables rode up, and in great haste dismounted, tied their horses, and met Master William and Mr. Hamilton returning from the barn, and after talking a while they all walked up to the kitchen door. There was no one in the kitchen but myself and John. Henry and Sandy were up at the barn. Mr. Freeland put his head in at the door, and called me by name, saying, there were some gentlemen at the door who wished to see me. I stepped to the door and inquired what they wanted. They at once seized me, and without giving me any satisfaction, tied me, lashing my hands closely together. I insisted upon knowing what the matter was. They at length said that they had learned I had been in a scrape, and that I was to be examined before my master, and if their information proved false, I should not be hurt. In a few moments they succeeded in tying John. They then turned to Henry, who had by this time returned, and commanded him to cross his hands. "'I won't,' said Henry, in a firm tone, indicating his readiness to meet the consequences of his refusal. "'Won't you?' said Tom Graham, the constable. "'No, I won't,' said Henry, in a still stronger tone. With this, two of the constables pulled out their shining pistols, and swore, by their creator, that they would make him cross his hands, or kill him. Each cocked his pistol, and, with fingers on the trigger, walked up to Henry, saying at the same time, if he did not cross his hands, they would blow his damned heart out. Shoot me, shoot me, said Henry. You can't kill me but once. Shoot, shoot, and be damned. I won't be tied. This he said in a tone of loud defiance, and at the same time, with a motion as quick as lightning, he with one single stroke dashed the pistols from the hand of each constable. As he did this, all hands fell upon him, and, after beating him some time, they finally overpowered him and got him tied. During the scuffle I managed, I know not how, to get my pass out, and, without being discovered, put it into the fire. We were all now tied, and just as we were to leave for Easton Jail, Betsy Freeland, mother of William Freeland, came to the door with her hands full of biscuits, and divided them between Henry and John. She then delivered herself of a speech to the following effect. Addressing herself to me, she said, You devil, you yellow devil, it was you that put it into the heads of Henry and John to run away. But for you, you long-legged mulatto devil, Henry nor John would never have thought of such a thing. I made no reply, and was immediately hurried off toward St. Michael's. Just a moment previous to the scuffle with Henry, Mr. Hamilton suggested the propriety of making a search for the protections which he had understood Frederick had written for himself and the rest. But, just at the moment he was about carrying his proposal into effect, his aid was needed in helping to tie Henry, and the excitement attending the scuffle caused them either to forget or to deem it unsafe under the circumstances to search. So we were not convicted of the intention to run away. When we got about halfway to St. Michael's, while the constables having us in charge were looking ahead, Henry inquired of me what he should do with his pass. I told him to eat it with his biscuit and own nothing, and we passed the word around, own nothing, and own nothing, said we all. Our confidence in each other was unshaken. We were resolved to succeed or fail together, after the calamity had befallen us, as much as before. We were now prepared for anything. We were to be dragged that morning fifteen miles behind horses, and then to be placed in the Easton jail. 
when we reached st michael's we underwent a sort of examination we all denied that we ever intended to run away we did this more to bring out the evidence against us than from any hope of getting clear of being sold for as i have said we were ready for that the fact was we cared but little where we went so we went together our greatest concern was about separation we dreaded that more than anything this side of death we found the evidence against us to be the testimony of one person our master would not tell who it was but we came to a unanimous decision among ourselves as to who their informant was we were sent off to the jail at easton when we got there we were delivered up to the sheriff mr joseph graham and by him placed in jail henry john and myself were placed in one room together charles and henry bailey in another their object in separating us was to hinder concert we had been in jail scarcely twenty minutes when a swarm of slave traders and agents for slave traders flocked into jail to look at us and to ascertain if we were for sale such a set of beings i never saw before i felt myself surrounded by so many fiends from perdition a band of pirates never looked more like their father the devil they laughed and grinned over us saying ah my boys we have got you haven't we and after taunting us in various ways they one by one went into an examination of us with intent to ascertain our value they would impudently ask us if we would not like to have them for our masters we would make them no answer and leave them to find out as best they could then they would curse and swear at us telling us that they would take the devil out of us in a very little while if we were only in their hands while in jail we found ourselves in much more comfortable quarters than we expected when we went there we did not get much to eat nor that which was very good but we had a good clean room from the windows of which we could see what was going on in the street which was very much better than though we had been placed in one of the dark damp cells upon the whole we got along very well so far as the jail and its keeper were concerned immediately after the holidays were over contrary to all our expectations mr hamilton and mr freeland came up to easton and took charles the two henrys and john out of jail and carried them home leaving me alone i regarded this separation as a final one it caused me more pain than anything else in the whole transaction i was ready for anything rather than separation i suppose that they had consulted together and had decided that as i was the whole cause of the intention of the others to run away it was hard to make the innocent suffer with the guilty and that they had therefore concluded to take the others home and sell me as a warning to the others that remained it is due to the noble henry to say he seemed almost as reluctant at leaving the prison as at leaving home to come to the prison but we knew we should in all probability be separated if we were sold and since he was in their hands he concluded to go peaceably home i was now left to my fate i was all alone and within the walls of a stone prison but a few days before and i was full of hope i expected to have been safe in a land of freedom but now i was covered with gloom sunk down to the utmost despair i thought the possibility of freedom was gone i was kept in this way about one week at the end of which captain ald my master to my surprise and utter astonishment came up and took me out with the intention of sending me with a gentleman of his acquaintance into alabama but from some cause or other he did not send me to alabama but concluded to send me back to baltimore to live again with his brother hugh and to learn a trade thus after an absence of three years and one month i was once more permitted to return to my old home at baltimore my master sent me away because there existed against me a very great prejudice in the community and he feared i might be killed in a few weeks after i went to baltimore master hugh hired me to mr william gardner an extensive shipbuilder on fells point i was put there to learn how to caulk it however proved a very unfavorable place for the accomplishment of this project mr gardner was engaged that spring in building two large man-of-war brigs professedly for the mexican government the vessels were to be launched in the july of that year and in failure thereof mr gardner was to lose a considerable sum so that when i entered all was hurry there was no time to learn anything every man had to do that which he knew how to do in entering the shipyard my orders from mr gardner were to do whatever the carpenters commanded me to do 
this was placing me at the beck and call of about seventy-five men i was to regard all these as masters their word was to be my law my situation was a most trying one at times i needed a dozen pair of hands i was called a dozen ways in the space of a single minute three or four voices would strike my ear at the same moment it was fred come help me to cant this timber here fred come carry this timber yonder fred bring that roller here fred go get a fresh can of water fred come help saw off the end of this timber fred go quick and get the crowbar fred hold on the end of this fall fred go to the blacksmith's shop and get a new punch hurry fred run and bring me a cold chisel i say fred bear a hand and get up a fire as quick as lightning under that steam box halloo nigger come turn this grindstone come come move move and bows this timber forward i say darky blast your eyes why don't you heat up some pitch halloo 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 three voices at the same time come here go there hold on where you are damn you if you move i'll knock your brains out this was my school for eight months and i might have remained there longer but for a most horrid fight i had with four of the white apprentices in which my left eye was nearly knocked out and i was horribly mangled in other respects the facts in the case were these until a very little while after i went there white and black ship carpenters worked side by side and no one seemed to see any impropriety in it all hands seemed to be very well satisfied many of the black carpenters were freemen things seemed to be going on very well all at once the white carpenters knocked off and said they would not work with free colored workmen the reason for this as alleged was that if free colored carpenters were encouraged they would soon take the trade into their own hands and poor white men would be thrown out of employment they therefore felt called upon at once to put a stop to it and taking advantage of mr gardner's necessities they broke off swearing they would work no longer unless he would discharge his black carpenters now though this did not extend to me in form it did reach me in fact my fellow apprentices very soon began to feel it degrading to them to work with me they began to put on airs and talk about the niggers taking the country saying we all ought to be killed and being encouraged by the journeymen they commenced making my condition as hard as they could by hectoring me around and sometimes striking me i of course kept the vow i made after the fight with mr covey and struck back again regardless of consequences and while i kept them from combining i succeeded very well for i could whip the whole lot of them taking them separately they however at length combined and came upon me armed with sticks stones and heavy hand spikes one came in front with a half brick there was one at each side of me and one behind me while i was attending to those in front and on either side the one behind ran up with a hand spike and struck me a heavy blow upon the head it stunned me i fell and with this they all ran upon me and fell to beating me with their fists i let them lay on for a while gathering strength in an instant i gave a sudden surge and rose to my hands and knees just as i did that one of their number gave me with his heavy boot a powerful kick in the left eye my eyeball seemed to have burst when they saw my eye closed and badly swollen they left me with this i seized the handspike and for a time pursued them but here the carpenters interfered and i thought i might as well give it up it was impossible to stand my hand against so many all this took place in sight of not less than fifty white ship carpenters and not one interposed a friendly word but some cried kill the damned nigger kill him kill him he struck a white person i found my only chance for life was in flight i succeeded in getting away without an additional blow and barely so for to strike a white man is death by lynch law and that was the law in mr gardner's shipyard nor is there much of any other out of mr gardner's shipyard i went directly home and told the story of my wrongs to master hugh and i am happy to say of him irreligious as he was his conduct was heavenly compared with that of his brother thomas under similar circumstances he listened attentively to my narration of the circumstances leading to the savage outrage and gave many proofs of his strong indignation at it the heart of my once overkind mistress was again melted into pity my puffed-out eye and blood-covered face moved her to tears 
she took a chair by me washed the blood from my face and with a mother's tenderness bound up my head covering the wounded eye with a lean piece of fresh beef it was almost compensation for my suffering to witness once more a manifestation of kindness from this my once affectionate old mistress master hugh was very much enraged he gave expression to his feelings by pouring out curses upon the heads of those who did the deed as soon as i got a little the better of my bruises he took me with him to esquire watson's on bond street to see what could be done about the matter mr watson inquired who saw the assault committed master hugh told him it was done in mr gardiner's shipyard at midday where there were a large company of men at work as to that he said the deed was done and there was no question as to who did it his answer was he could do nothing in the case unless some white man would come forward and testify he could issue no warrant on my word if i had been killed in the presence of a thousand colored people their testimony combined would have been insufficient to have arrested one of the murderers master hugh for once was compelled to say this state of things was too bad of course it was impossible to get any white man to volunteer his testimony in my behalf and against the white young men even those who may have sympathized with me were not prepared to do this it required a degree of courage unknown to them to do so for just at that time the slightest manifestation of humanity toward a colored person was denounced as abolitionism and that name subjected its bearer to frightful liabilities the watchwords of the bloody-minded in that region and in those days were damn the abolitionists and damn the niggers there was nothing done and probably nothing would have been done if i had been killed such was and such remains the state of things in the christian city of baltimore master hugh finding he could get no redress refused to let me go back again to mr gardiner he kept me himself and his wife dressed my wound till i was again restored to health he then took me into the shipyard of which he was foreman in the employment of mr walter price there i was immediately set to caulking and very soon learned the art of using my mallet and irons in the course of one year from the time i left mr gardiner's i was able to command the highest wages given to the most experienced caulkers i was now of some importance to my master i was bringing him from six to seven dollars per week i sometimes brought him nine dollars per week my wages were a dollar and a half a day after learning how to caulk i sought my own employment made my own contracts and collected the money which i earned my pathway became much more smooth than before my condition was now much more comfortable when i could get no caulking to do i did nothing during these leisure times those old notions about freedom would steal over me again when in mr gardiner's employment i was kept in such a perpetual world of excitement i could think of nothing scarcely but my life and in thinking of my life i almost forgot my liberty i have observed this in my experience of slavery that whenever my condition was improved instead of its increasing my contentment it only increased my desire to be free and set me to thinking of plans to gain my freedom i have found that to make a contented slave it is necessary to make a thoughtless one it is necessary to darken his moral and mental vision and as far as possible to annihilate the power of reason he must be able to detect no inconsistencies in slavery he must be made to feel that slavery is right and he can be brought to that only when he ceases to be a man i was now getting as i have said one dollar and fifty cents per day i contracted for it i earned it it was paid to me it was rightfully my own yet upon each returning saturday night i was compelled to deliver every cent of that money to master hugh and why not because he earned it not because he had any hand in earning it not because i owed it to him nor because he possessed the slightest shadow of a right to it but solely because he had the power to compel me to give it up the right of the grim-visaged pirate upon the high seas is exactly the same End of chapter 10